I like that hat, Joe Bianca, as we get underway. It's Jason, Joe, and Tommy. That reminds me, Mr. Joe and Tommy, too, and for myself, we've got a brand new West Point gear store. Yeah, that's a big upgrade. Yeah, a lot more, a lot more options, uh, a lot of really slick stuff. So if you haven't checked out the new merch store, go look at it right after this podcast. Absolutely. Don't go anywhere. We will cover, obviously, and as we get get underway and launch from the gate here on this this opening opening Keeneland Spring edition of the WPT podcast with Joe Bianca, Jason Blewett, and of course Tommy Murphy. There's a lot of ground to cover. I mean, in reality, the three of us could sit here and talk for the next four hours about last weekend and this weekend with the last round of the derby preps and everything else. And we've got a slew of horses. We'll try to we'll try to keep it short. I hope everybody out there, including you two, had a good Easter. But why not take a, a quick step back? And Tommy, I'll start with you to Florida Derby Day last Saturday at Gulfstream Park and for West Point. We got started. In fact, the only horse we had in on the day was in the Pan American Handicap. And what I mean, what'd you think? What'd you think of Cortez? That was awesome. I was over the moon that he was able to get up in time. And a lot of the times I find myself when I look at these races, handicap them. I see Christoph a lot of the times with the first time Euro Invader, and I'm like, oh boy, that's basically a free square in the pick five, pick six, wherever you're playing. But it was really fun for us, West Point, to be on that side with him and get that win and i mean i just thought he was road to perfection and he did what he had to be done and i think this could really be a nice springboard for him to start his year and really make his mark on this order you know, super long turf race division we had a lot of fun uh you know a number of west point partners and even a couple of prospects were at the races on saturday so it's always fun generally speaking it's a big racing day first and foremost but you've got a stakes for us it was not the deepest pan american feel that we've seen even over the last few years so all that stuff kind of added up and and thrown in a cauldron just just made things even more exciting so for cortez to break through and having tom bell house down here it was definitely a fun florida derby day on sunday for us and we were right back with Christoph Kamant stable. And I mean, CC is just, he's such a master, but Joe, I mean, all right, we lost a tough one with don't look back at all. Who just got cut down late by a pretty, pretty solid Ontario bread trained by Mark Cassie. But for me, I mean, like pros and cons of her race, I'm left probably with a minimum of a half a dozen sort of, pro check marks and i mean again outside of losing a tough one my friend there wasn't a lot to gripe about with her four-year-old return on easter sunday no it reminded me a lot honestly of the glen cove at aqueduct her three-year-old finale where she was tracking a pretty fast pace and then kind of inherited the lead probably a little earlier than you would ideally want and then she got passed over the top that time by dance macabre similar kind of setup this time they were going super super fast early i love she just broke so sharp like she's just one of those horses that does everything right and we should had 100 horses like her in the barn mm -hmm. broke on top broke on top but was it wasn't headstrong settled beautifully made that first run on the on the speed that i think backed up a little earlier than jose thought and like you said just got nailed late but 89 buyer new career top this was kind of just a stepping stone for her. We think eventually she's going to be better going six, five and a half and six than five furlongs. But for her horse, first off the layoff at a distance, it might be a little bit sharp for her. Like she ran her eyeballs out and lot, lots to like for sure. Absolutely. So we'll see what Kristoff wants to do. Don't lose sight that she is a PA bred. Turf is her preferred surface. I mean, she's run well. She's won on dirt. Ran okay on the synthetic at Press Sky. Oh, that's probably third if I had a lineup. Don't look back at all and just her her surface preferences in order. It'd be turf, dirt, and then the synth. But, yeah, I mean, you've got options with her and an exciting start to her season and very much looking forward to Cortez and don't look back at all. Shipping up north. It's a little, little melancholy for me. I mean, I get spoiled, Christina and I, living in Fort Lauderdale, getting to – you know, pretty much have three and a half, four months with, with our horses down here, but everybody has kind of left town. So it was a good, a good and, and fitting end to the Gulfstream Park winter meet. That's probably a good segue guys into the first triple crown prep they ran last weekend that we will cover and at least put a bow on. Not that they're 
I think right here and right now, there's a whole lot to add to fierceness. Clearly moving on to a 20 horse field, that's going to be a big conversation, which fierceness shows up in the Derby. But Joe, I mean, uh, in terms of like a, a Derby prep and we'll get your thoughts too, Tommy, Joe, I'll start with you. I turn to Christina probably midway on the clubhouse turn, like just as fierceness had kind of cleared off and made the lead. And I said to Christina, I'm like, he's going to just roll. And I mean, there were, there was no one within a, a zip code of him as he, you know, shades a flight line with that 110 buyer in the Florida Derby. I'm not going to say Johnny V watches this podcast, but I did say last week that I thought if Johnny could do the Holy Bull over again, he would just send the horse to the lead and not bother stalking a horse that he thought was going to back up to him. And this time, like the 10 post kind of forced his hand a little bit, but he was he knew he wanted to get the lead this time around. And it's, it really was one of those powerhouse races where, you know, like a flight line, it just kept widening and widening and widening. And it was never a doubt. It was just a question of how far he was going to win by. Listen, talent wise, he's obviously the best three year old in the country. I don't think it's particularly close. You could say Nisos maybe is a close second, but he's on the shelf now. It really is just going to come down to pace. And do you trust him at a short price in the Derby if he doesn't get everything his own way? Because if he does and if he's able to get loose, I don't think he's he's beatable at all. Like American Pharaoh, untouchable if he gets loose and gets the trip that he wants. I mean, you have anything to add, Tommy? I mean, outside of the obvious with, with, with fierceness? You guys basically covered it. I mean, when I was watching that race, I literally, I said to myself, so like, wow, he's doing his best flight line impression. Um, mm. And like you said, Joe, if he gets the lead by himself in the Derby, I think he's just gone. I don't really think anyone's going to be able to run him down. He's just so, so good up front when he's by himself. So, but you never know. You never know what he's going to draw post-wise. You never know what he's going to break. You never know what the horses that are next to him are going to do. So a lot of variables there, but if everything does go his way, which on – with derbies, especially with favorites, usually doesn't happen, at least in recent years. So you never know. But I'm really excited to see him here in Louisville, and I think it'll be a great race. And yeah. then we had Muth, who fierceness drilled out in Cali. He returned. Again, Timberlake, I felt, showed. And I was happy to see Brad Cox, for what it's worth, a couple of days after the Arkansas Derby, say we're not pressing on a Churchill with Timberlake. That strikes me as the kind of horse – you turn back and you point to the Pat De Mayo with him on, on the Derby undercard. But with Timberlake not running, I mean, guys, there wasn't a whole lot in the rear view mirror behind me. It was probably a similar, similar situation to Fierceness, who of the two was way faster and just more visually impressive. But, I mean, Joe, any, any thoughts on the Arkansas Derby again, which once Timberlake didn't get the distance, pretty much was a one-horse race. Yeah, I mean, it kind of looked like that on paper, too, with not, not too much speed signed on. You th figured Muth was going to get that kind of outside sweet trip. And, yeah, it was it, it was a foregone conclusion, I think, by the 316th poll or so, 8th poll. Um, so, I'd, I don't know. I, I you, you mentioned the, the point about fierceness, like, and, and the pace in the Derby. One thing I've noticed, someone did a study about this a little while ago, and, like, since they went to the points qualifying system – the paces in the Derby have gotten slower and slower because you can't just throw in a rabbit. Like I think about Spanish chestnut back in the day, it was like a rabbit for the Tabers um, in the Derby. And you just can't do that. Song anymore. and a prayer. Yeah. Check yeah, out like, the half mile time for a horse right. named song and a prayer. Cause it used to be, it used to be graded earning. So you could have a stone cold, super fast sprinter who maybe yeah. won a graded stakes, obviously over the winter time that could get into the Derby. Yep. So it's, it's, it, uh, I would be lo less inclined to bet fierceness under those circumstances than I am now. But yeah, Muth is one of those horses who's like probably in that second tier and I think has gotten, had a pretty soft path to the Derby. Uh, I, you know, I, I just don't think, obviously, you know, I don't know if you saw the news that Baffert's, so Zadat is suing to try to get a lot, like a last gasp to get those horses in the Derby. So it's not unreasonable that he could end up in the Derby, but he's just not one of those horses that's going to excite me for the triple crown regardless. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think frankly speaking, and I know you guys agree because we, we touched upon it here and there in previous editions of our little fireside chat. We were all sick of the, the Baffert Churchill stuff. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with the lawsuit. I kind of personally rolled my eyes when I saw the news breaking 
what was that on Wednesday or maybe late Tuesday afternoon that the lawsuit was going on. But Preakness could be good if if we get the good fierceness and he's just too much in the derby and you've got Muth and maybe a couple other Baffert horses waiting for him in Baltimore. That could be a, a legendary Preakness, certainly better than uh, the last few Preaknesses we've had. Let's fast forward, guys. We'll get on to uh, opening day at Keeneland. It's April. Meanwhile, the year is just flying by. Tommy, our, our little West Point Keeneland season, at least for the spring, of course, gets underway in earnest fairly early Friday. And I'll call up the PPs here. We've got we've got Sense of Pearl, who's going to be – she's going to be a price and, and found a pretty salty field. But she's going to make her second start in the uh, – on the dirt for Steve Asmussen pretty early on the uh, Friday card at Keeneland. Yeah, I'm – Really excited that she we got it in this spot with her and get her on the dirt. I think that'll, in the long run, end up being her preferred surface. Um, Turfway, it's tough. Some of these horses love it. Some just hate it. And you really kind of have to draw a line through it. But I thought she ran really well on debut to run third at Turfway. And like you said, it's a salty field. And there's a lot of other horses coming out of Turfway. So I'm very intrigued because if I remember early on last year, maybe two years ago, I can't exactly remember. But I think there were a lot of turfway horses are running really well early at Keeneland. So I'm intrigued to see if this form can hold and these turfway horses come in hot. And for our sake, I hope they do because we have one and it would just be a fantastic start to Keeneland spring meet to get her a win early in the card on opening day. I know we're going to have, it's going to be an awesome crowd there. You know, a bunch of partners there. It'd just be a fantastic yeah. way to start it. I'm jealous. I get, I, uh, I had the whole West point East coast division pretty much down here for four months, my own, they're gone for 24 hours. And now I'm jealous. I'm not going to be at Keeneland opening weekend, but no, good luck. Good luck to sense of Pearl. I had a little bit of back and forth with a couple of, uh, partners on, on my end that are, that are in on her. And I said, look, win, lose or draw, pretty deep field i'm encouraged steve wants to take a shot and he feels confident to take a shot on the dirt and again for me my main takeaway want to see her not only run well but just take a nice step forward in her second start a uh, neat trick will take some play in that race who lost a tough one against our very own sedona you've got this todd pletcher philly who got a, a very big number running second as the favorite first time out at aqueduct uh, Chad uh, notoriously points for this meet. So it does look, if you were to ask me to like in your mind or in my mind, be like, draw up early in the spring meet, a three-year-old Philly maiden race on the dirt. This is the kind of field I'd probably come up with. It won't be easy, but good luck to sense of Pearl. And then we've got Joe, the one, two punch a bit later in the day with depiction and Kajino running in the, in the Transylvania. I'm just glad, and I'm going to check as I send it to you, Joe. I'm going to take a look at the forecast. I'm glad with that crazy weather they had a couple of days ago. I'm just glad everybody everybody's okay. Yeah, no, it's going to be some, some scary weather that, that blows through that part of the country and seems like they uh, avoided the worst of it and will have a dry track for opening day. Uh, I think maybe there'll be a little bit of give in a turf course. But a high of 48, dude, on opening day, a low of 36. Up. Up. So, up, Tom. yeah, um, bring but, a jacket. So, as far as, as the, the two in the Transylvania go, like, you know, Cugino's dying for a trip, man. Like, we just we talked about this before. Last time, there was a bunch of speed on paper, nobody went, and he basically had to come home in under 22 while uncovered on both turns and just missed. So I'm just hoping, like, I know the 12 hole isn't that great. I'm hoping there's enough pace. I don't see like a ton of like, you know, gun to the front types, but I see a lot of horses who want to be close. So I'm hoping it'll at least be fair and he's able to drop in because he's just like, I don't know, he, he was he was pretty unlucky that day. Thought he had kind of a weirdo trip to back as well. Even his maiden win, like he had to close into yep. a slow pace. Definitely did not have things his own way. You know, depiction is a step behind him, I would say, but did run well in the bourbon last year. Was only beaten two and a quarter lengths. Uh, came back, closed into a slow pace similarly in the Danny of Beach Stakes. So he's had a little bit of time off since then. I don't think he's impossible at a price. Obviously, if I had to choose the likelier winner, it's Cugino. But, you know, he needs things his own way. He needs th things to set up for him for once. And I think depiction does too. So let's hope for some pace. 
Yeah, definitely. No, depiction feels like a live long shot to me. I think Cagino at this point is the more talented horse, even though depiction drew the better post. But they both, they've got to get lucky. This is the kind of race that if you ran it 10 times, to my eyes and the way I feel about it, given given how contentious it is on paper, and I think the morning line favorite is four and a half to one here, the uh, Godolphin horse for Charlie Appleby in the eight musical act. But given how wide open it is, 12 horse field on this turf course, kind of race you could have maybe seven, seven and a half, eight different winners if you ran it 10 times. So you're going to need racing luck. Uh, the favorite, excuse me, at four to one is number six, first world war. But I mean, Joe, it's a good group of horses. I have no issue with, with Brendan Walsh's horse. And, you know, we, we've seen the kind of work over the last, say, five years or so Charlie Appleby can do when he brings a Godolphin horse over here. I mean, as they say, he's a guy that is shipping for a reason, not yeah. the season. Yeah, exactly. And, like, he's he's one of those guys that it's like, it doesn't even really matter what the horse's form looks like. Like, this horse probably looks like a little bit slow on paper for this race. Mm-hmm. But I'm, am I going to be surprised when this, he gallops at three to one? Absolutely not. So he's he's just one of those guys you always have to include. I mean, even Cam Group. Cam Group won the Bourbon last year and was only beaten two lengths in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf, had the fastest final quarter in that race that day. He's going to need some pace as well, but he's a horse that is a grade two winner, was only beaten two lengths in the Breeders' Cup, and is probably going to be double-digit odds. So that tells you how strong this field is. Definitely. Good luck to the boys there, to Piction and the Kujmeister in the Transylvania on Friday. And I was uh, texting a little bit. Uh, we've got a lot of partners. I mean, we own a hundred percent of Cagino uh, and it's a, it's just a big partnership and it's a partnership. It varies per horse, but that is a group that loves going to the race and seeing Cagino run in person. And I was texting a little bit with Ted, Ted and Kathy Myers who are at, at we're in Lexington and uh, we'll be at Keeneland tomorrow. I'm like, make sure you pick up. I know a couple of people from Florida that'll be buying some uh, Keeneland, some Keeneland hoodies in the in the Keeneland gift shop. But should be a great opening day. I hope you, Jeff Lipson, and the team, Tommy, have a great time. Let's fast forward to Saturday, Bluegrass Day, and we've got we've got a pretty pretty busy day. Um, as we we take this, I think we're all happy and relieved that uh, Scatify not going in the uh, in the Lafayette uh, train this morning, evidently jogged this morning, had great energy, is doing well. Of the two, Tommy, and I tend to be, it's just my nature, I think, with racing. I tend to usually like lean into the more conservative side when it comes to mapping out or campaigning a path for any particular horse. So the allowance race opposed to Friday's Lafayette was my first choice. Again, for what that's worth, I'm not in charge. And I'm looking forward to this horse just kind of kind of taking a step back after that, the craziness of the San Felipe. And, uh, you know, looking forward to him getting back on track because we know this is a fast, very talented colt by Justify. Yeah, after that last race, I like that you drew a line through it because that's about the first thing I did after that race was over, just draw a line through it and, and move on to the next. And I think this is a – this. I agree with you here. This is the spot I kind of selfishly wanted to see him in. Just give him a little bit more of that class relief, cut him back a little bit. I mean, he's shown in his maiden win that he can kind of come off it a little bit. And he's one of the distance. And then it's second out, he showed that he's got a little speed, but he faded there. So I'm intrigued by this race. I mean, you have two Wesley Wards, who's Mr. Keeneland, really. And I expect one of them to have a little bit of pace, whether it be the one of the three. I'd imagine probably Bledsoe, uh, three with Tyler riding for him. But as you can see, we're four to five in this spot. I think that this is just a really good spot for him to just get back on track after that whole nightmare of a race last out. Just put it up, put it behind us, put it on the horse. Let's move on. Let's get to Keelan. Let's get a win. I'll be curious what price we are. I think for me personally, the six horse pirate is way too high at four and a half to one. I think he'll be second choice. And uh, I don't know. I'm curious to see how big a gap. I know he's a little light, light on figures on buyer. He's way slower than our horse, but just given the connections, the fact that he's training so sharply and 
they like that horse a lot, even though the hopeful came up a, a slow and kind of wacky race there with Nutella fella. Timberlake and BU have since come out and done some good things. Uh, so good luck. Good luck to Scatify. I mean, if he runs well here, that Joe would probably open up a number of different avenues or at least conversations that need to be had. Preakness, Pack Day Mile, you know, looking ahead, the Woody Stevens in Saratoga. Because I'm not sure. I'm curious what you think. I'm not really sure what this horse, and he's only run three times, of course. But if you were to ask me, hey, what do you think Scatify is best at? I don't, on the dirt anyway, I don't think I have an answer right now. Yeah, and honestly, like, I, I think it, time might tell that he's a little bit better going shorter. His dam was a five for a long turf sprinter. Obviously, Justifies can do anything, but the dam side leans a little bit more sprinty. So, obviously, we'll give him every chance going two turns. But I do I do lean that way that he might end up being a really nice seven for a long to a mile horse. I agree with you on Pirate, too. Like, there's no way that horse is going to be nine to two. And yeah, it's a bad line. Bad, bad even, price on him at four and a half. Debut, like, even at his debut, like, look at Just Steele's comeback to do. Like, Just Steele was just second in the Arkansas Derby to Muth that we were talking about before. The seven horse has got a little bit of class and speed for Rick Dutrow. So, I'd be shocked if we're four to five. I think those three horses are going to vibe for favoritism um, and all be kind of in the seven to five to three to one, seven to two range. Yeah, four to five. He may he may wind up odds on. It just seemed like a little too short for me. But regardless, it's a it's it's a great little matchup there between at least the trio of very solid and talented three-year-olds and good luck. Good luck to Scatify. I'm glad uh, we're taking a step back and trying an allowance. There's, there's plenty of, of three-year-old restricted stakes for big pots throughout the course of the season. And it's a long one. And we want a horse for the entire year. Uh, that's a good segue, just sticking with the three-year-olds, but jumping over to the turf with, with stop the press. Uh, Joe, this is a horse that cost a lot. Didn't show a heck, heck of a lot in his first three races. But as Shug had intimated to me, and it was in the updates a few weeks before that February 3rd grass race at Tampa, I think we've got a turf horse on our hands. And I think he's better for me than that 68 buyer. That race was better than a 68 buyer going back and watching it. Yeah, I agree. And usually when you're five and a half lengths clear a third, you get a little bit more of a, a benefit of the doubt on those buyer numbers. It didn't seem like he got much. This is a, a feel full of question marks. I think like these, these kind of longer distance turf races typically are like when you get up to a mile and three sixteenths fact distance does start to become more of a factor even on the grass. And there's nobody that really sticks out to me. Like the fastest horse on paper is right outside of us in Tapakina, who's obviously got a little bit of talent, but has never been on the turf. It's not, doesn't have turf breeding that screams at you from off the page. And where else are you really going in here? Like white Palomino, maybe towards the inside for Chad, probably a little bit dangerous, but this is a very haveable field to me, especially for opening weekend at Keeneland. So I'd like to see him be really competitive in here. And yeah, well, we'll see, we'll, we'll get a better sense of what that, what that buyer means after Sunday. Yeah, I'm anxious to see. I mean, obviously, the Pletcher horse, that's a private buy switching over to Todd. That horse ran fine in his two races. But I'm I'm with you. All in all, not an easy spot. None of these races are layups, of course. It's Keeneland in the spring, and it's a 12-horse field. But, no, I like our chances with Stop the Press and just think we're going to see – we're going to see a faster race and a nice, nice move forward in his second start on the turf. And for what it's worth, I'm treating him as a second time starter. At this point, I don't really care because uh, how well he ran. I just don't really care about the three dirt races to start his career. Getting back to what I said at the top of our little get together here. I mean, we could turn this podcast into a into, a, you know, a three hour Godfather part four that just goes on and on and on and on. I mean, looking at the stakes races and the kind of car they put together at Keeneland. Brevity, as the boys will attest, is not my my strongest suit, but we'll we'll bounce around and just really hone in on the West Point, West Point owned horses or partly owned horses. And that, of course, Tommy, leads us to everybody's favorite daughter of gunrunner in Vava who is looking to become our first grade one winner in 2024 in the, in the Madison at seven eights. She drew great and we get a little matchup here, buddy against the six out of a star. They put on a good show last season in the Raven run. 
that they did. I was there that day. And for a little bit, I thought that Alpha Star was gone and we would be running for second. And then when Vava found that extra gear and got home, it was awesome. And you know, I'm almost expecting a very, very similar race there. I think it's going to be obviously her up front and then we're going to have to come and catch her. Um, and looking at the paper, if we can run back to her Raven run form, I think this, we're more or less going to be able to get there with that kind of speed figure we're going to go by. And we've done it before, so why not do it again? But there, this field, is it's a really nice field. Um, the one that caught my eye that wasn't Vava was red carpet ready. Um, that horse has always just run really well. And she had that one clunker in the victory ride. And, and other than that, she's just been really, really rock solid. So that's the horse that I looked at that may be close to us wanting to come from a little bit off of it. So that's the horse I'm going to keep my eye on, especially during the race. Yeah, I'm a red carpet ready fan. I like that filly a lot. I've liked her like a lot of us. I mean, she kind of bounced on my radar or wound up on it last winter when she was three and won the forward gal and then didn't run as well in the Devona Dale. But she's been so solid. And I like the fact that she's by more or less a turf stallion, but she's a dirt horse there, an Oscar performance with red carpet ready. Uh, Joe, we've got the outside post with Bava, and as good as Alva Starr is. And, I mean, she's – I like horses like her too. She's, you know, she's not trained by one of the super trainers. This is a smaller barn. She had a pretty humble beginning or start to her career at Delaware Park in the slop back in early four of 2022 the one difference though or edge that in my mind we have i think vava of the pair you know our philly definitely wants to go seven eights i think we have the edge in that department as far as the distance goes yeah no doubt um and that's that was like the winning margin in the raven run I think doesn't isn't a, isn't a good demonstration of how impressive that race was because she had to go and get Alva Star. Like you have a horse that has that kind of quality on the lead, loose on the lead in the stretch. I, t you know, typically I would say this horse wants to go six rather than seven, but I don't think she was stopping. Vava came and got her, and it's just so impressive to see horses like that, especially on the dirt. So, and I what I love about Vava too is like she's not a deep closer. Like she's got the speed to lay close if the pace isn't that fast. Outside draw is absolutely perfect, especially with Irad riding. I, she's just so solid, and I love the way she got better as the year went on. So I think there's big things in store for her as a four-year-old. You know, I'm not, I'm, this isn't the be-all, end-all if she wins this race. But if she does show up with her A race, she's going to be very, very tough. And I'm excited to see what she can do on, on Sunday. I'm right with you there, pal, for sure. We've got the bluegrass. Let's just touch upon it. Very solid field. For my money, and I felt as though the two preps they had between the Risen Star and the uh, Louisiana Derby, I thought Fairgrounds, by and large, those were the two toughest preps just in terms of quality from front to back. But I got to hand it. I got to hand it to Keeneland. This is a very, very nice rendition of the bluegrass here. Led, of course, Tommy, by Dornock and his rematch against Sierra Leone. Uh, they were 1-2 in that, in that very memorable Remsen last December over a very inside speed bias track that no doubt helped Dornock and adversely affected Sierra Leone. But you have a horse here with Sierra Leone who, I mean, he's done nothing wrong. I'm a, you know, despite the fact he's a huge deep closer, which you can run into issues with, I'm definitely a fan, fan of this horse moving into the bluegrass. Me too. And, and what intrigues me about this horse too is that his last two races been on a non-fast tracks, wet, sloppy, whatever it may be. And he's run his eyeballs out both times. So regardless of what happens in this race, I imagine we see him for Saturday in May in Louisville. Um, and for, for God forbid, if there's any sort of rain uh, Derby day, I mean, this is a horse that I'd be really intrigued by, but this spot, if, if it was up to me and if I had to single one to end, whatever ticket, I'm probably going door knock, especially with him being three to one. He's already beaten Sierra Leone and sure. The fountain of youth didn't really, end up being much with all the scratches that had happened but I mean, he took care of business there did what he had to do and i just think especially because you know his brother's already done it um maybe he's got a little bit of that edge on uh, sierra leone you never know but um here i think i'm gonna go door knock 
Let me hear you, Joe, because I walked away from the fountain of youth very unimpressed. And look, I like Dornock. I like Danny Gargan, uh, Mark Pine, who's a West Point partner, owns a piece of this horse. So, you know, there's there's emotional or friendship rooting interest involved here. But I don't know. Like, hearing the horse was like 80 or 85 percent cranked, I don't know how much I buy that, considering at one time the fountain of youth looked like with Speakeasy in there and a couple other horses that defected out of the race pretty late. It looked – it looked like it was going to be a much tougher race than it turned out to be. So, I mean, where do you stand with Dornock? No, for sure. Like it's, you know, this was one of those instances where like, if you had prop betting and racing, there was like an over under how many lengths he would have won by the under would have hit on like, not, or the over the under <laughs> cleaned up in that race because well, after all those scratches, you think this is going to be an eight, 10, 12 length winner in here. And he gets pressed by this horse, Ladon bro, who was like, even in a four horse field was like 30 something to one and <laughs> barely put that horse away. I just think he's a lot more hype than substance so far. I definitely think he's got ability, but on paper, like for him to be three to one against some of these, like to me, that's not value whatsoever. Even like Sierra Leone being two to one, like just there's too much that's got to go right for him in order to get up in that race. I landed on just a touch six for Brad Cox, seven to two on the morning line. We'll see how they actually bet it. Maybe he'll be a little bit shorter than that, but of the three favorites to me, he's the stick out. He was dominant first time out going six furlongs had to run in that absolute monsoon last time in the Gotham and really tracked the pace and ran hard every step of the way determinist that came and got him later down the stretch but i thought he ran his eyeballs out came back with two sub one minute works going five furlongs at keelan to me he's he's the horse you want out of the three favorites there's a couple horses to the interest to the inside who are interesting top connor who i like this horse i like that horse i mean long term he's one of the ones i would want out of this field i am a big top connor fan Listen, and it's going to be – it's it's a big step up. He's got to go two turns. He's drew the rail, which is not ideal, but he overcame it in his debut. He took a ton of money in that race and ran to it. Obviously, BU took a bunch of times to, to break his maiden, but 96 buyer last time out and what we all said was a really, really loaded field on that uh, Fountain of Youth Day. So there's other places to go. To me, I'm against Darnock and Sierra Leone. Of the short prices, I lean towards just a touch. Otherwise, I'll be looking inside. It's a great bluegrass, though. I mean, really a fascinating race between the rematch, but you know, the rematch, of course, between Doorknock and Sierra Leone. And then you've got the uh, Justify for Brad Cox coming out of the Gotham and then horses like Top Connor and BU and in, you know, that are right like fringe players a little below the surface. So great bluegrass. Good luck. I hope everybody has a great weekend and good luck to the uh, West Point crew Saturday in Lexington, Kentucky. Let's stick with the Saturday action, guys, and we'll we'll bounce home to uh, well, well, I should say we'll bounce to what was my my former home. It is now the current home and has been for Joe Bianca. This one's in your neck of the woods, Joe. Uh, Wood Day was always a day I look forward to, pretty much all winter. Like you had Gotham Day, and that was the start of spring is kind of in the air belmont's not that far away the derby the triple crown all that stuff but wood day it's like you know what spring is here uh i know the weather's been a little little rough in your neck of the woods but i mean you feeling it dude are you happy going out to the big a saturday because i'm a little jealous of you as well you and tom bellhouse will be there i'm so stoked man you were talking you were talking before about how you already missed the horses that have shipped up north this was like my first time having horses that I, you know, are basically all my pets. And when they shipped down south, I missed them, man. I didn't realize mm-hmm. like how much I was going to miss them until like middle of the winter. I'm like, damn, one of those horses coming back up north. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to get them all back in my neck of the woods and go see everybody, go see the crew again. And yeah, this was a great way to kick it off. Like wide open field, a horse in Pamplona Red that I think has turned the corner a little bit in her works recently. Her last two works much quicker than she had been breezing earlier in this year. She took a little while to come around. Love getting Johnny Velasquez. Like, that cannot hurt. First time out, drawn outside. No killers to me on paper in terms of the horses who have run so far. So, I mean, I you know, I always keep my expectations in check with first-time starters. But I'm expecting a big effort out of her. And it's, yeah, like, like it's going to be a great way to kick off the spring here in New York. 
And it's been it's been a fairly long road, not without a couple of hiccups here and there for Pamplona Red. I mean, that goes for most horses. There's an ebb and flow, and just that's the reality of this thing. But I'm I'm just happy. I'm really happy to see her uh, just a, a day day away or a couple of days away from from her career debut or start. Uh, Tom's not really a first out guy. I mean, clearly Tom, although he's He's from England. He's got a little bit, and he's a younger guy. But there's kind of like an old school horseman vibe I get, just with the way he runs his program. And you know, it's not just about the first race; it's about a career. So good luck, good luck to P Red there. And it's neat, neat seeing. It's always neat to have Johnny, Johnny riding one of our horses. I was gonna say, you know, Johnny, Johnny took off Vava in the Grade One Madison because he'd rather ride Pamplona Red first out. I, I'm sticking with that. That's what uh, I'm going to tell people look, if she wins, just to keep it between us. That's not true. Ab- absolutely right. I, the little, little, you know, joke there, a little tongue in cheek, but it'll be, it'll be a great story if she comes through and and runs gigantic first out. The deuce calling an audible. The two has had her chances. I mean, she's going to take some money because she's got proven form. The seven focus pocus is off a layoff, but ran obviously ran pretty well last season. Guess the Linda Rice horse will be bet a little bit. The nine five to two, but all in all, looks like a fairly modest, as Joe was saying, pretty modest group of uh, New York breads. They've got a whole bunch of stakes as well on this uh, Wood Day card, and although. It pains me to say it, Joe, and and Tommy too. Like when you look back at winners of the Carter, which is no longer Grade One. It, I mean, it's a legendary who is who, and it's still a race I I hold near and dear. But this year's Carter is is pretty pretty soft looking. I was not also, and I'll get. I want to get both of you guys in here i'll start with you tommy i wasn't blown away per se compared to the bluegrass as far as like this cast for the wood memorial but but it's a full field you got a baker's dozen you got 13 ready to rumble and i mean leading the charge tommy you're gonna have the nine tuscan sky who's never run into stakes for todd pletcher and the gotham winner for our good pals over at christophe Comont and the four deterministic what are you doing, my friend? I mean, how are you viewing this year's Wood Memorial? I I love deterministic in the Gotham. Um, I thought he had halfway decent price, but here I think he's seven to five on the morning line, which is just a tough pill to swallow in this spot. Um, I actually I I lean towards the one a little bit, oddly enough. Um, just very kind of a mott esque horse where it's just slow, slow progression, and finally he breaks through, and he didn't run a terrible race in the register obviously it's beat by three really nice horses um and he was 17 to one that day um love that johnny v is back on him this seems to just be a johnny v podcast at this point but this is just a horse that i have a gut feeling might might show up and might give us a little something that we're not expecting and hopefully at a price i'm with you i think that horse will run very well Yep, resilience. That's a good pick. Good pick, Tommy. Joe, I mean, this is this is your local derby prep. Where where are we going, my friend? Yeah, I wish I had a, something funky to to give you guys. Like, I don't know, maybe maybe society man. If the race really falls apart from the outside, um, we've seen some kind of funky results in the wood in recent years. Uh, I like I'm an Uncle Heavy fan, the PA bread for butchery, but he's in the 14 hole. So that's going to be tough. I, I, I like the way Tom's thinking of, with the horse at the rail. We'll see what kind of price he is. But I do think this is the typical kind of mod horse who's brought along slowly and then starts to peak as they enter that graded stakes company. But yeah, for me, it's really just about deterministic and Tuscan sky. Hate to chalk out in a 13 horse field, but they just look like stick outs to me on paper. All right, Tuscan Sky, uh, Colt by Vino Rosa, great Colt by Vino, uh, making his stakes debut for Todd. I mean, clearly a lot is expected of this horse off those those very fast figures to this point. Should be a great day at the Big A. I will be watching from sunny Fort Lauderdale next to Christina and Zizi rooting for Pamplona Red. And, of course, uh, some Rapoli stable horses throughout the day. Before we get out of here, guys, I do want to give a quick shout out to everybody. I know we've had a few everybody's favorites on this on this edition of the podcast so far, but 
in this case, I really mean it. We have everybody, and I do mean everybody, everybody's favorite Indiana bred in Runaway Rojo, who's back back in the action, Joe. And uh, pretty wild coincidence, actually, that you brought up you brought up on the horse call we had earlier today with the team. Yeah. So this he's going to be running in the dark side of the moon handicap right as an eclipse is going over the racetrack. <laughs> I think that this that fortune is going to be kind of in the in the direct path of, of the eclipse. So I don't what the odds are of that. Uh, that's some kind of cosmic coincidence. But yeah, I, you know, he's just such a likable horse, man. Shows up every single time. And it's just, it goes to show you that like. Not every horse has to be a grade one winner to be a fun horse, a rewarding horse to have in the stable. Like if you had a nice Indiana bred who can compete for some big pots and show up every time, like look at that, eight eight in the exacta out of nine career starts, he's already earned his purchase price back and then some. So he's he's a great kind of, I guess, example for why blue collar horses can sometimes be just as fun as high class stakes horses. He's been terrific. I mean, he's really been a joy, this horse. We got the stakes win. He had a pretty nice rivalry going with a very talented Indiana bred in his own right in King Ice. That was really fun and enjoyable to watch last summer. But good luck to him. Look, he's outside for a start back. He can go the five and a half. He's already won going five and a half. We know that, and we know he can run fresh. I just, and I'm sure I'm not alone, just want to get a good effort into him. I hope he wins, and he's certainly going to be one of the favorites. But it's a 12-horse field, a lot of horses, I mean, are on the same path we are. Talented Indiana breads, talented state breads that were laid up over the winter that are coming back this spring. So great to see him in the entries, Runaway Rojo on Monday with the solar eclipse and the dark side of the moon. I mean, you couldn't draw it up any better. Uh, Wednesday, little, little shug action. Uh, I, I was pleasantly surprised is probably a good way to put it with Battle of Normandy, getting the entry notification that our good buddy Battle of Normandy was in Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, sixth race on April the 10th at Keeneland thought the plan was or at least this horse had really really you know found himself and had really kind of hit his stride last summer in in the longer races at a mile and three sixteenths a mile and five sixteenths but in talking to Shug Shug not only has liked the way this horse has breezed and he's worked three times with the blinkers on that'll be a new equipment addition for him in his four-year-old debut on Wednesday but Shug wants him to get maybe outrun a little bit and just finish up and, and this will be a good spot to get him started. Uh, Tommy, I know your dad owns a piece of this horse. We're all, I, this is one of these West point horses. I, I mean, we, we get attached to every horse in the stable, but I feel like for me that the fan club, like the West point fan club for battle of Normandy, it's, it's, it's palpable, and we're happy to see him back in the entries, my friend. I mean, what are you thinking with his with his 2024 debut on the horizon in just a few days? I, honestly, I wouldn't even call it a Battle of Normandy fan club. I think at this point it's just the Adorable Miss fan club with uh, <laughs> Battle of Normandy and Cugino. Um, but it would be sure, sure cool if we can get both of her foals to get a win in opening week at Keeneland. Um I'm excited to get him back. Like I said, my dad's had a piece of the source, so I've been hot on him for a long time now. I've always had a soft soft spot for him, and I love we get Tyler back on him and just really find a way to start off the year strong. Gets, if, you can't, if he doesn't win it, that just gets something we can build, build on and go have a successful four-year-old season. I mean, he got good. I know there were some wide trips, and, like, I was I – was- devastated is putting it a little a little too bluntly or at least a little hyperbole there but when he didn't win like creek this day when he had the wide trip from that bad post and that was on the heels of of another wide trip when he was rolling late and finishing like a wild horse last april at keeneland at four to five i remember thinking wow you know did did i overrate this horse is he as good as i thought he might be as a three-year-old and then of course joe ran big at, at huge odds, Whitney day and the Saratoga Derby. And I, I feel like we got the true, like the true gauge and a, a true, a true just overall feel to his talent in the last race he ran at Kentucky downs. I mean, where are you, Tommy likes him. I like him. Where are you with him coming back on Wednesday in this mile allowance race? 
Yeah, I think he's he stacks up well. I'd forgotten the kind of figures he got for those two stakes try, the 92 and an 87. So those put him right with the top horses in this race. I'm interested to see what kind of campaign he has because he's one of these horses that clearly has talent. But for his two seasons so far, I feel like he's just been a slight cut below the top horses in his division. I'm hoping that he takes a step forward and is competitive with the top horses in the turf division this year. But I think like worst case scenario, he's like a nice grade three, grade two type of horse. And I think this will be a good place to get him started. And I think he's, you know, it'll be interesting to me to see how well he runs going shorter. Because I think the idea was towards the end of the season last year, this is a horse who needs to stretch out and needs more, you know, time to to unfurl that kick. Now with the blinkers on, maybe Shook thinks he'll be a little bit more handy. Maybe he will be better going a mile. I think that'll be interesting to see in terms of plotting out the course for what distance to have him at the rest of the year. You've got mischievous angel off the layoff. That horse was was okay last year in two races for Chad. Now with Georgia Breu, who I'm a fan of. I, I tend to not like, and there might not be a ton of pace in this race, but these Gulfstream speed horses off that super firm turf course that's so tilted generally to early speed, like the Alexis, the 11 horse Alexis Zorba, never going to go to a horse like that. But working my way through the field, I was like, oh, you know what? Even if he's a little bit better at the end of the day going – further than the mile distance this looks like a pretty pretty solid spot very comfortable spot as far as the competition goes for battle of normandy to make his seasonal debut why don't i uh stop sharing my screen i'll come back on with you guys um tommy before we say goodbye you were out not only checking in on the older horses and the horses that are three and up what's the scoop because with keeneland opening tomorrow Maui Strong's at Churchill with Dale, and my boy Yinzer is at Keeneland with Steve Asterson. What'd you think? Uh, I was surprised when I showed up at Churchill. Uh, uh, Dale said, oh, the Kittens Roy Colt just got in. So I was excited. Um, get to go see him. And I had, I had to ask him, are you sure it's the two-year-old? Uh, and he's just a, just incredibly strong, incredibly well-built horse. I'm really excited. If anyone knows me knows I'm a sucker for Kittens Joy. Um, he's probably my all-time favorite. Um, love seeing him in pedigree. So this horse gets me excited and just his physical, and I can't wait for him to get started. And Yinzer, too. I just saw the photo of him, but he looked great. I'm really excited for him, too. I mean, it's hard not to be. It's that time of year where it's almost like new beginnings. So you're getting these two-year-olds to the racetrack finally that you either bought as a yearling, so you've been sitting on for so long, daydreaming how good they're going to be, or you buy them at the two-year-old sales and – you're just itching to get him to the racetrack and get him into your, your trainer's program and just see what you got. So it's that time of year, and I'm looking forward to it. I think we got some good ones. Yeah, every single one of them at this time of the year. I mean, the possibilities are endless, and they've all they've all they've all just got a, a, a ton of promise and potential, and that that's the beauty of of this thing of ours. Uh, Joe, as we uh, say goodbye here, just a quick reminder. I mean, dude, it's already. It's already the first week of April. Keeneland's about to get underway. Last round of Derby preps. They haven't drawn, by the way, the Santa Anita Derby. We should mention that. Um, we're taping this on Thursday. Oh, did they draw the Santa Anita yeah, they Derby? Did. I am wrong. So, yeah, what's going on at Santa Anita? I'm remiss, guys, not to mention that. I apologize. Yeah, I think there were eight. I didn't look at the fields. Uh, it doesn't in, look like a – There's eight in, the, eight in the Derby, five in the Oaks, I think, is what I saw yesterday. Yeah, spot on. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the best three-year-old likely running out there with Muth having on Oaklawn and Nysos on the shelf for a bit is probably, in my eyes, the three-year-old filly. I think her name's Kinza, that Carpe Diem filly for Bob Baffert, who uh, I would imagine is going to be a big favorite in the Santa Anita Oak. So, again, the point is, last round of Derby preps, it's April, and along those lines, we'll, we'll the gang will be back in Ocala for OBS April, Joe, so – uh, you know, big, big shout out, big thank you. Uh, we, uh, the horses we bought in March, I mean, they literally sold like hotcakes, which is wonderful. And I think we're all like the morale, the excitement, everything. It's just all the dial is about to snap off because it's just it's all positive. Uh, just a couple of weeks away from from April 2024 at OBS. Yeah, no, it's it's a great time of year. And like you, like you guys are saying, like none of them have done anything wrong yet. They're all superstars until they prove otherwise. 
And it's an exciting time. Like I always love having the OBS April sale, the proximity of it to the Derby, because it's everybody is dreaming. Everybody is looking for that Derby horse and every one of them could possibly be it. Even if it's a $5,000 purchase to a million dollar purchase, that's what keeps everybody coming back. And it's, it's great at West Point that we're, we're able to have the numbers in order to be able to get to those higher spots. And I think we're going to pick up another bunch of really nice horses at the April sale. You know, we got a lot of new new partners that came in at March already. So shout out to all of them if you're watching. And yeah, we're, we're ready to keep building, man. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Let's also sign off. Thank you, gents, for, for joining me for, what is it? Eh, getting close to an hour, the West Point 60 here. We we got through it fast though. It was all it was all prime rib, okay? I mean, this was this was a high quality chat session with you guys. Exactly. My compliments to the chef. All right, for Tommy <laughs> Joe and Jason, we'll catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in. See you guys.